everybody welcome to episode number 57 of fresh mondays podcast so happy you guys have tuned in with us for this brand new season of freshness and new beginnings and making sure that we keep you up to date with things that you guys need to know yes and last week we had a fantastic episode with a great guest um, of course, talking about our beauty and skincare, my favorite topics of regular day life. We had Tova from Goddish Skin. We had a fantastic conversation. And your response has been great because people really truly identified with the parents and friends supporting your business piece that we discussed. And I loved hearing that a lot of business owners or entrepreneurs have gone through that same struggle and understand exactly what we were talking about and like, that emotion, that feeling that goes with it. So thank you to everyone and all your comments. Thank you to Tova again. Thank you to Goddish Skin, making our skin look popping in 2019. And uh, keeping it fresh, actually, that's what it is. Everything is always keeping it fresh. So thank you to Tova for that. Yes, and uh, thank you so much also for everyone who uh, had commented, reposted, retweeted, shared. Um, every time you guys do that, it helps us. It makes us a stronger podcast. It gets more people to pay attention. We have a guest tonight. His name is Ernest White. And Welcome, Ernest, to the Fresh Mondays podcast. Please, please introduce yourself. Tell the world, everyone, who you are, what you do. Uh, Diana, thank you very much for uh, having me here. Marley, thank you very much for having me here, ladies. Uh, <laughs> I am uh, Ernest White II, storyteller and explorer, lover and connector of people. Uh, I do visual storytelling as well as written storytelling. What that means is I work with film, television, um, fiction, writing, short story, travel narrative, uh, many different uh, things. And they all center on helping people feel seen and empowered and loved. That's pretty much what I do. That all sounds beautiful. How did you become this storyteller, explorer, you know, how did, how, how, what led you to this space to, to being that? You know? So I've always been interested in stories from when I was a child. I mean, I loved having stories read to me. I loved watching film, uh, movies, TV shows. And um, so I guess it was just a natural, it was, it was part of my calling from the very beginning because I was naturally drawn to these things. Um, I read at a very early age, started reading at the age of three, and I probably started writing maybe when I was six or seven years old, little short stories and poems, and uh, it just has always been a part of my life. And so it's kind of a natural outgrowth. I also grew up, you know, with film uh, being just as important to me as literature. You know, I love the idea of reading and, and, and imagining the way things look in my head. And so to see certain things on film, that was just even another level. And so it's been something that's always been, been in me. And I ended up uh, studying pre uh, political science when I was in graduate school and I worked in politics, or sorry, when I was an undergrad and I worked in politics for a little while, but for graduate school, I ended up going to get my MFA in creative writing. And that was really where um, my creative juices were stoked, if you will. Right, because I know in the past you had a pretty uh, popular blog and you used to actually do some journalism in uh, other countries as well. Uh, can you tell us a little bit about that experience? Yes, I actually lived abroad. I lived outside of the United States for almost a decade. I uh, started in Colombia where I began as an educator and I started keeping a blog on the side because people were asking me like, oh, Ernest, tell us about your life overseas, what it's like. This was in 2005. So, you know, there was no Instagram. Yes, there was Facebook and Friendster and a few other like social media platforms, MySpace. Um, but blogging was just taking off. It was an easy way. Um, before, when I first moved over, you would just send like these group email updates. Um, but then eventually you had the opportunity to kind of do much more frequent journaling and posting. And so I started early on um, at a time when no one was making any money on blogging. You were just kind of talking about your personal life. Um, but eventually it started becoming, for me, uh, important to do service pieces, reviews on um, books and, and media and um, you know experiences that I was having, city reviews and uh, talking about new restaurants and things. And, and so it became almost magazine-like. Um, and at the same time, 
you know, I was still teaching, but I was doing more and more freelance writing on the side. Uh, and that was after I got my master's in creative writing. So, you know, this was after graduate school. I had done, you know, little bits and pieces of journalism here and there over the years. But as time went on, there was a shift from being a full-time educator into a full-time writer. Um, and that took a few years, but it was kind of gradual and it was happening nonetheless. And uh, I did have a, mo a peak moment back in like 2010, 2011. Um, I was one of the few uh, expat bloggers. I was one of the few black expat bloggers. Uh, I was one of the few male black expat bloggers. I was one of the few male black, you know, gay expat bloggers. I mean, all that stuff, um, you know, there was there were very few voices like mine, but at the same time, my voice resonated with many different types of people. Uh, you didn't have to be black to understand, to, to kind of relate to what I was talking about. Um, and that was actually kind of gratifying. You know, it's always nice when your people feel you, but it's also nice when people who don't look like you email you saying, you know, hey man, I'm Swedish, but like, I really, you know, I really resonate with what you're writing about. Um, and I had a podcast back then as well and some other things. And eventually I ended up having a bona fide journalistic job as an editor at uh, Time Out Sao Paulo magazine, uh, which is a part of the Time Out chain, which is a, a, um, a chain of magazines that talk about what's happening in the city and that kind of thing. And so my blog kind of, um, you know, my focus was shifted more to my journalistic career. Um, and then I started doing some TV travel channel back in 2013 um and some other things and and so the the blog has been kind of limping along as other aspects of my um storytelling career have started to to gain momentum so um but i mean the blog was where it started and uh, so just that ability was, to connect was ernest white the second well ernest white number two that's the way it's on the actual website so it's ernest white two um dot com is that the I guess the, the most resemblance to your blog, because I know that you have a lot of awesome stories on it and you have like, a, like, well, I personally know you, so I know your person, I know your humor. You know what I mean? So it's like, I know a lot of your humor kind of translates even in your titling and, and just categorizing the different things that you can read on that website was, is that kind of like what the blog has emerged to now? Well, so actually, ErnestWhite2.com is more my personal site. Uh, the blog was Fly Brother, at FlyBrother.net. So uh, FlyBrother.net was where the blog started. Um, it was actually Fly-Brother.com, which you can still use. But plain old FlyBrother.com, somebody in China owns that. They owned it before I even like, okay. Interesting. Um, You're going to pay them like $1,000 exactly. to get Basically, it or something? Because they use, I mean, they just put like two English words together. You know what I mean? And like, they renewed it. <laughs> that is, that's a come up nowadays yeah. like, I went through the same thing that is a pure come up no I doubt no doubt. and charging people for them you know, I ain't mad at China but I'm gonna get that name <laughs> uh, but anyway so like flybrother.net is where you can go back and even if you search the archives I mean there's some old stories from like 2009 my very first blog posts and all that kind of stuff and um, I chose a few of those that I felt like were most representative of the work that I do to put on ErnestWhite2.com, which kind of showcases me as a person as I was trying to, at one point, separate myself from the brand Fly Brother. Um, and I think it is interesting to kind of keep that going because I write fiction, I write other things that are not necessarily um, under the Fly Brother or travel umbrella. Um, so I would say those two sites, though, are kind of two sides of me. Um, ErnestWhite2.com does go more in depth uh, with, you know, as far as my interests and my um, capabilities holistically, whereas Fly Brother is very much travel and culture related. But uh, there's like a Venn diagram of those two together. Right. How many uh, countries have you, because you said you lived 10 years outside of the US, so how many yeah. countries have you been to? And then if you can, which one are your favorites or what's like your go-to? Sure, favorite? sure. Um, so I have lived in five countries around the world, and that would be um, Colombia, Brazil, Sweden, sorry, not Sweden, Germany, South Africa, and before all that, the Dominican Republic. Um, I did, and well, the U.S., I guess that's the sixth country, but five countries outside of the U.S. Um, and then I've traveled to about 70 um, that is about half of what some of my friends have been to, you know, like wow. 
to the 90 <laughs> countries so in the world. So you have more friends. Like, that's very awesome. I got people who, the thing that w- with me is I'm probably out of all of us, one of, one of uh, just a handful that lived abroad for a long time in one particular place and would keep going back to the same countries. Okay. So that's a, the difference. Like a lot of people just keep going, you know, racking up the country number. Was I would go back to Brazil, for example, like four or five times a year before I moved there. And then after I left. Um, and so out of, you know, out of all the countries, my favorite, you know, by far, bar none is South Africa. It is home to me. Um, there's no other place like it for me on this planet. And I just have a very deep abiding connection to that place. I love it. I love the people. I love the the culture and just being there. Um, that's, you know, that's all I can say. Uh, very, you know, like my second tier solids that I love to go back to all the time, Brazil, Sweden, Ireland, Canada, India. I love India. Um, the, Namibia is amazing. Ethiopia, um, Egypt, uh, Spain is cool. Sw- Switzerland. You know, I'm chic like that. Um, <laughs> this is <laughs> like, I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm making the mental do. list. I'm making oh, yeah. the mental list of places that like work can pay for or I got to figure out how to do right, 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 right. Uh, I used to know Venezuela. I used to go to Venezuela all the time before up to about 2009. That was a country, it's sad because, I mean, it's sad anytime a country um, just kind of implodes like that. But Venezuela was a place where the culture was interesting, the people were interesting and attractive. Um, like, I used to go in there. But Miami is getting a nice influx of Venezuela. <laughs> Miami under, is becoming a little Venezuela. <laughs> is. Under sad circumstances, but they look yeah. good. So how do you know? <laughs> <laughs> For the most part, I agree. People from Venezuela are attractive. That's yeah. true. And, and nice. I feel like they're, they're, you know, they're cute. But they're also affable. They're, they're very similar to Brazilians to me in that way. Like, they, if you see a whole bunch of them together, like, it's going to be a party or a fight. <laughs> <laughs> And, and they're hardworking. They're hustling out here. Like, I could give yeah. them that. Like, they're coming out here with a purpose, and they're really working. Mm. And that's what they think. For real. And a lot of them are trying to learn English, too, coming yes. straight here. And, like, it's, I mean, I appreciate that. Like, yes. I was going to say, that's I'm a pleasure. About, 100%. I'm all about multiculturalism, multilingualism. I speak several languages. But part of that is because when I moved to other countries, I had to learn the languages that they were speaking to have a day-to-day life. You know, it doesn't mean lose my own language. It doesn't mean lose my own culture. It means add to. And that's what creates the connection. So the fact that, you know, people from many different places come here and at least try, that's the thing. You know, they don't have to be perfect. Just have an attitude of like, you know, I, I want to at least try to communicate with folks. I think that's a, that's a, a great segue because I was going to ask you, what are the languages that you do speak or have learned while being out there? Because I do, and I just had this conversation with someone out of family member who said they don't like these countries, these countries, and these countries that they've experienced and been to. And then to myself, it's like, what did you actually take in while you were there to yeah, speak that you didn't yeah. like? Like, what was that experience that then makes you say, I don't like this? Because were you open and understanding of the culture prior to going? So yeah. if you say, I don't like Texas, but do you know what Texas is about and what surrounds and the different cultures that are around Texas, right? Or like the area that you're in. Mm-hmm. So for you, when you were in these locations in these uh, other countries, um, what languages did you learn? And of course, how did you kind of absorb all of that with, with being there? So I think, thank you. I mean, that's a really good question or a series of questions. Uh, for me, one, I'll start with just by saying you, places are like people. You know, you don't have to get along with the place. Just because, you know, I don't get along with a place doesn't mean that you won't have an amazing time there and vice versa. Just because you were uh, treated amazingly and had a wonderful time doesn't mean I'm going to have that same experience. And it's okay. You know, it, it, you don't have to love a place because someone else loved it. Um, but I will say that it does require a sense of permeability, a sense of vulnerability, a sense of willingness to be changed by a place, you know? Um, even if it's, let's say you go to a place and you don't like it, you don't like what you see or, 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 um, something, uh, disturbs you in a society. I'll give you an example. I was in one particular country where, um, it was in the Middle East and I didn't like the way I saw, um, 
impoverished women on the street being treated. You know, people on the street and most places get treated like shit, you know. Um, but to see like the like men barking at women like that, like that, it, 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 was, a, it was unsettling and upsetting. And at the same time, you know, it's not my culture, not my country, not my language. Um, at a, you know, there's this, this kind of impotence and also a recognition that, you know, sometimes you do have to let things play out the way they're going to play out and be changed enough to know that, like, find out, you know, talk to women who you can talk to, you know what I mean? I, I'll get to the language part, part in a second, but like, you know, if you feel some kind of way about what you're seeing, then find out from the people that are, that you feel like are being affected, that you are victimizing in that way of saying like, oh, this person is a victim. Find out if they feel like a victim. Find out what right. their thoughts are on it. It doesn't mean that, you know, your intuition is necessarily wrong, but it may help you deal with it better, reframe, find a way to be in that place, in that space, and not be so disturbed by it. You know what I mean? Like, it, it, the women could be like, no, it's okay. Or, you know, and you're still kind of like, eh, it's not really okay, but... You know what I mean? Like it's at least giving them agency back and, and, and taking that yoke off of you of having to, you know, feel your feels about whatever you're seeing. That said, um, I speak Spanish and I speak Portuguese as well as English, um, my native language. Um, I started speaking, I started learning Spanish in high school. I continued on through college and then lived in several Latin American countries, as I mentioned, um, Colombia and traveled to several Latin American countries, Dominican, Colombia, um, and then mostly in the Caribbean and South America. And then also in um, Brazil, uh, where I picked up Portuguese. And believe me, I mean, they make a huge difference. When I go to these places, I'm able to really connect with people because I understand, you know, a lot of the humor, not all of it, but a lot of the humor. I understand a lot of what's going on. I understand, you know, there's sometimes when I'm better than others, if I've been out of them for a lot and, and out of that language uh, environment for a long time, you start to forget. It's natural. I didn't grow up with that. Um, but then if I go back in, all of a sudden it comes back to me. And, and, and so the access that I have, you know, it, it, a lot of places I have access because of how I look. Um, because, uh, and when I say that literally, I mean, because I am a man of color, I, I'm Black American. Um, however, I'm coded often as different depending on where I'm at. You know, there's certain places in Latin America I'm not considered Black. There's um, South Africa I'm not considered Black. Um, and so, like, there's that. Inhabiting this body with a very Black-identified identity, but being told on the outside and treated differently than what I would expect to be treated as a Black man, you know, whatever that means. Um, and so... That allows me access in many different ways, but that language part, nothing else can give you that same kind of access, you know? Right. And so even sometimes knowing just a little bit, just a little, a few words of saying like, thank you, or excuse me, or please, or, you know, I'm sorry, I don't speak whatever language in that language. You know what I mean? Like those things just open up so many more opportunities for connection with people. Right, because no, Americans have a little bit of an issue with f expecting everyone to speak English everywhere they go. That's yeah. like Americans are like that. Like we literally are, we feel inconvenienced in other countries. Like no one speaks English here. And it's like, at the end of the day, this is not your country. This is not the native language here. And I've been in other countries where other Americans are truly pissed because there's not an English option where you are, but that doesn't happen everywhere you go. Everywhere is not a tourist attraction. Everywhere doesn't have those things. So you have to respect that culture. Just like when foreigners come to us and speak to us in a different language or we treat them like shit, like you need to understand that's going to be reciprocated when you go to other countries. Yeah. No, I mean, you're 100% correct. It's, it's, it's a, one, it's a luxury to be born in a place where your language is the lingua franca of the world. You know what I mean? Like we are born in a country with a language that is now the language of technology, of science, of commerce, of, you know, of everything. But that is not anything you did. You know, like we came here by the grace of God in that regard. I mean, it could be, you know, woo. I'm kind of woo. And they talk about like, oh, we incarnated in these bodies. Yeah, I get all that. But at the same time, like you, you ain't have nothing to do with that either. You grew up at here. You didn't grow up in, let's say, Mongolia or in the Basque country of Spain or in plenty or, or France or plenty of these other places 
where there's no other language, Georgia, but there's no other language like that language, which means you have to learn somebody else's language if you want to move out. Haiti, you know, like right. they speak Haitian Creole, but like if you want, like a lot of people teach their kids like, um, uh, what is it, traditional French. I don't know what the exact term is, but they teach them French because they're like, we want you to be able to go out into the world, you know, but that's the, 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 the everyday language of people is Creole. And so the point is that we are blessed to be speaking English, which allows us to go to places and not have to learn so many other languages. But it's right. essential that that is that sense of entitlement. That is a sense of entitlement. You know, that is not empathy, nor is it humility to go to a place and expect people to be catering to you to speak English. If they do in places, that's wonderful. It's amazing. Thank you for learning that and for making life easier for me. But at the same time, if there's a, a miscommunication or if there's a lack of communication, it's for me to bridge that gap. To use a damn dictionary. Like I, it, it boggles my mind when I look at people overseas or even people who come from other countries. The heater, especially, you know, being in Miami, you see folks coming, like, I mean, you got a phone with a dictionary on it, with a translator on it. You know what I mean? So we go overseas too and it's like, damn, Google it. Google Translate, translate.google.com. Yes, you may mispronounce it, but try. There's, yeah. nothing more, there's nothing more humbling, especially for me. Like, I think everyone should travel international once in their life and see how, like, I was once, I went out of the country and I was like, came back and I was like, I realized how American I was <laughs> in that very, like, I was two weeks in um, Amsterdam and that is English, right? Like, it's kind of, everyone speaks either Dutch or mostly English, but yeah. came back like, oh, I had really moments of like, you're super American, chill. Bring yeah. it down. Yeah. Or like I when you ask for me. ice for all your drinks and everybody looks at you crazy, like, why do you That's need all ice? I wanted was like, <laughs> all I wanted. Drink. It's like you read my mind because that's all I kept asking for. And there's no understanding of like, why she... Yeah. They're like, oh, you're American. You want ice. I just want ice. Right? So <laughs> there's nothing more humbling experience. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> it's a humbling experience or kind of like humble I guess I don't know if humbling is the word but kind of just draws you back and be like you're being super American right now like you can tell yourself different culturally from everyone else no it's incredibly I think humbling is a good word and that's it that to be humbled and to be humble that does not have to be a bad thing you know what I mean like we look we all consider ourselves to be progressive we all consider ourselves to be interested in other cultures and, you know, empathetic and wanting people to feel whole and complete and free to do whatever they want to do. And yet we're human beings. We've got our own idiosyncrasies. We've got our own biases and prejudices that are baked into the cake of the society that we were brought up in. And so those, the, the idea of being humbled is just recognizing there's always something to learn. You know what I mean? So, like, if we run up against something where we're being out of pocket and loud, one, it's about forgiving ourselves. I mean, Americans are loud. We come from a loud society. There's actually, like, that doesn't have to be a bad thing. Mm -hmm. Either we're from big cities where everybody's, you know, there's a lot of noise and you got to talk over them, or we're from the countryside where there's a lot of distance that you got to talk over. Yeah. But either way, when we go to places like Japan, when we go to play, I mean, they sound like they in a library compared to us. But you have to look at it as exuberance. You know what I mean? It's not necessarily a bad thing. It's just a matter of if someone brings it to your attention, oh, you're kind of loud. You know, you just be like, oh, you know what? My bad. Like, it's as simple as that. Like, I'm sorry. I mean it. I mean it, y'all. You Diana, know? <laughs> Diana, can you imagine us loud ass Dominicans up in like Japan yelling at each other? Y'all, my aunt literally yells when she speaks. Like, she doesn't yeah. even have an indoor voice. Like, her yeah, voice is you at 10. You. You feel me? And it's like you, yeah. I, when, when you go visit them, you're like, wow, everybody's really yelling in this house. But like, you just know <laughs> that this is just. But it's fun though. I mean, but the thing is, like, and I'm Southern. So we can yell on one hundred and two. Um, but actually, so there's an interesting th juxtaposition because um, Brazil has the largest number of Japanese um, people out, uh, people of Japanese descent outside of Japan. That's because of their history at the end of slavery, I'm going teacher on y'all. At the end of slavery, um, the Brazilians brought over Italians to try to do the work that the slaves did on the, uh, or the enslaved Africans did on the coffee plantations. But 
because the conditions were so bad, the Italian government said no more. So around 1900, they started importing Japanese migrant workers from the southern parts of Japan, kind of like the places that were warmer. Um, and they were also, they had already started going to Peru. And so Japanese laborers were known in South America. And so they started bring, importing them into uh, Brazil around the state of Sao Paulo. And so there was a huge Japanese Brazilian community that was built up over the 20th century. Well, some of those Japanese Brazilians, I mean, they Brazilian, you know, they grow up dancing samba, playing soccer, being loud, you know, all of that. And then they go over to visit their grandparents in Japan. So look Japanese, but they straight up Latin, you know what I mean? They just yeah. uh, dancing down the street hey! and all of that. And like, they, after a while, there's, there's stories of, I mean, I'm, you know, exaggerating, I'm also generalizing, but there are stories of Japanese Brazilians coming back to Brazil and saying, like, it was too damn quiet and calm and orderly, and, like, <laughs> it was a cultural disconnect. Yeah. So it is, it, you will go to certain places, and you will see folks who look like the rest of the population, but they've been reared in environments that are just much different than what they were used to. Originally. Right. Right. And- since basically you are an explorer, I know you have that as one of your titles because you are a people connector and all this other beautiful stuff that you do on the side. But most importantly, you're an explorer. And because you're an explorer, I know that that has led you to this new venture of Fly Brother. And I want you to tell everybody about this in beautiful show that I had oh, yeah. the honor to see the preview and to see the premiere. It was really awesome. I want you to tell everybody and our listeners and our followers and everybody in, in, the, in the world what is Fly Brother? So Fly Brother is a television show, a docu-series that is all about friendship and connection around the world. And in it, I go to visit some very good friends of mine in different cities, and they take me around to see their, the favorite things that in their city. Like, they show me their favorite things. And yes, we get to hang out in cool places. We go to great restaurants and stay in nice hotels. But the whole point of the show is to demonstrate that it doesn't matter our background or boundary that, you know, the whole world really is our tribe. And so it, it's essentially what I've done over the last 20 years. It's just like build a global network of friends and lovers and business partners and just, you know, connect to people. I love loving people. I love talking to people. I love, you know, getting to know people. And that's, you know, that's been the blessing of my life up to now. And so you know, to be able to be in a situation where I'm able to do it on camera and to show people, you know, you don't have to fly halfway around the world. Just go talk to your neighbor. You know what I mean? Talk to your sibling, talk to your mom or your dad or whoever's in, you know, with you, like connect. Um, and that's the whole purpose and focus of Fly Brother. And the show is set to debut on PBS later this year. So we're excited about that. We don't have a date yet because we're in post-production, but we will let you know as soon as possible. And I'm just hype about the possibilities and um, just that ability to, to really help people to be seen, you know, like I mentioned earlier, like that's all it is. It's, it's nothing more than that. So these are your friends that you go visit in countries all over the globe. And yeah. then they kind of teach you like, all right, I know that's what they said, but let me take you to this really good hole in the wall restaurant that only people from here know and you get to eat here. And let me give you a little personal history because I'm from this neighborhood and I want to show you like that kind of a feel. Exactly, all of that, just like you said. I mean, these are people that have held my hair back they over the toilet, they have, you know, where the bodies are buried. I mean, I, you know, some of these folks uh, not revealing my age completely, but I mean, I've known some of these people for at least 20 years. So, and we were fully grown adults. <laughs> so, uh, so yeah, like, and that, again, like I said, that's the amazing thing. It's like, these are folks that I'm like, hey, you know, calling them up or on WhatsApp or, you know what I'm saying? Just like, I'm trying to do this show, like, would you be on it? And they're just like, hell yeah. So, you know, it, it's a way of having, it's a way of inviting all my friends around the world to the same party. I love, that's, that's fantastic. Like, I, I like that, like bringing everyone together, all these yeah. experiences, all these pieces that you have spread out throughout the world and yeah. in one place and all these people can kind of see each other, meet each other. You've probably spoken about one person in another right. country, about another. So it's all yeah. shown in one place. And it's yeah. like you're making your own kind of like history, like your, your own little book or something like that, or like your, your 
instead of just it's more live not just on the blog but more kind of can be seen in a whole other light and hear these people Correct. Talk about those kind of things a hundred percent that's something really good to to. <laughs> i'm excited for you in this thank you very much thank you um, when he does the actual uh, screening in Seattle, Marley, you can be there because that's the next step that we need to get him out to the Seattle coast and get you and your homies and all the creatives you know to come see that oh, premiere, the Seattle edition. Yes. Indeed. And, you know, Seattle loves some documentaries, <laughs> loves some shows, and anything that's like, Seattle's a very cult, like a creative place. So anything yeah. new that's out there and coming out, they love to be a part of. So. And indie Wonderful. supports indie, and that's like the Seattle yeah. culture. So that's and really not awesome. Seattle. Seattle's a great town. I've been there a few times, so you know it, we we cool Seattle. So what's what's next for Fly Brother? We know it's coming out in PBS, but like like how can people really follow it? Like how do people stay up to date? You know how people lose attention quickly. Like how do people know? No doubt. No doubt. So there's um the Instagram account at Fly Brother B R O T H E R. <laughs> um, make also, make be, sure the spelling yeah, is correct. <laughs> exactly. It ain't brother. Even if brother. you may hear me say brother, it's spelled the standard way. I was a former, <laughs> the former English teacher. Um, then also uh, the Facebook fan page, Fly Brother Fly. Uh, there is flybrother.net. Uh, there's some updates that need to happen, and they will. Um, and then, you know, in terms of, uh, you can also follow me, Ernest White 2, the number two. I'm the second, but it's Ernest White, the number two dot com, which is my personal page. Um, and then what else, what else, what else? There is, um, I'm having these get fly get togethers where I basically connect people when I have the screenings, you know, and uh, you can find out more about that by going to, again, Fly Brother Fly uh, on Facebook. And uh yeah, I think that's it. In terms of what, where Fly Brother is going, I mean, we, PBS does have the broadcast platform. So, you know, you, can, you will be able to catch it on television, um, cable, as well as broadcast in certain markets. But the other thing is it will be available digitally as well. And we've got connections around the world, literally, because some of my friends around the world work in TV. I was a journalist. So, you know, I've, got those, I've been set up. The universe has set this all up. I didn't plan it. That's the other thing. You know, it's just when you look back in hindsight, it's like you can see where the dots connected. But as you as I was going forward, I had no clue that this was going to be coming down the pipe. And I still don't know what's coming. So that's the exciting part. Very cool. Very yeah. cool. So I know that you do the premieres in different cities at different locations and yeah. uh, you keep people posted. I know you have something coming up soon in Miami on the 21st of February. Yeah. Um, will you be putting that on your Instagram for people to follow up? Yes, I usually put, uh, we talk about the, uh, or we promote the screenings, uh, maybe five days to a week out or five days to 10 days out. But sometimes, you know, it's about organization. Uh, we may get a space that's offered to us uh, free of charge at the last minute or something like that, but it's always the right time. And so we will be having a screening definitely in Miami on February 21st. Uh, it's a screening and a fundraiser and a get fly get together. So please, again, stay tuned at Fly Brother on Instagram and Fly Brother Fly is the Facebook fan page. Very awesome. Now, I want one last thing from you before we let you sure. go. Okay. Yes. Because the reason I'm saying this is because, like I said, this man is a master of words. Um, he is a poet by nature and his presence influences. So I want you to just leave us with um, a, a positive way of closing and 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 sharing your energy and you've you've helped me in ways earnest that we're going to keep it very 100 that i probably will never be able to repay you in actual monetary value because you believe and you are very good at connecting people and that is hand to god he is good at connecting people <laughs> so i want you to leave people with a positive note and positive energy and just share your love with the world um, well, one, first of all, again, Diana and Marley, thank you both ladies for having me here today. I, it was a pleasure, short, but very, very sweet. Um, and I would just say that it is really, and I'm not always, you know, I'm a human being, you know, I wake up feeling like shit. I wake up get, people getting on my nerves and it, all that stuff. So don't think that I'm just out here this, you know, Zen embodiment of love every day. Hell no. Nah. But take it when I feel the best in life is when I'm able to love people freely, you know, to allow um, people just to 
to feel like they are magic and stardust. You know what I mean? Like we are made of the same thing that the stars are made of. Like that's science. (laughs) And so because of it, like, I just want everyone to feel amazing. I want everyone to feel beautiful. I want everyone to feel powerful and impactful and worthy of love. And so all I can say is you are worth it. That everything, you, those dreams that you've been given are there for a reason. Those dreams are there for you to turn into reality. And when people say that it may not be the way you imagine it, it's because we only imagine things based on some of the circumstances that we've come through. Um, but when we allow the universe to show us the ways that we can be magic, it's mind blowing. Um, quickly, I know we have to go, but for me, for example, I, I, I wanted to be a writer for a very long time. But when I would write, I would actually envision uh, the scenes that I was writing as if they were the film, you know, the film version. And so I, uh, when I was writing my novel in graduate school, I put together a notebook that had photographs of the actors and actresses that would play the characters if I had cast it right then. Uh, I made a soundtrack album. I would listen to it as I would write scenes. And to be honest with you, it was quite cinematic. Now, and amidst much resistance, I didn't want to do this. I had my own issues. I was an you know, obese teenager and a whole bunch of other stuff that kept me from wanting to be on camera, wanting to be doing what I'm doing. But now, I mean, I've, I've been doing the inner work to heal that. Um, but now I'm able to actually, I'm moving into the space of filmmaking, of creating cinema, of telling visual stories and showing people, not just telling, but showing people the beauty of life, the beauty of love. And I didn't imagine I would be doing this, but it really is what my dreams were early on. I thought my mind was telling me I could do this as a writer, but the universe, God, whatever you want to call it, is telling me I can do this as a filmmaker, as a visual storyteller, as a storyteller, as a lover of people, of the world, of myself, of love itself. So... If anybody can only take one thing out of that, just know that the, your dreams can and should come true. How dare you not let your dreams come true? If, you're, if you've got, you know, I'm rambling, but if you've got like the, the support, if you've got the foundation, if you've got a family that, that loves you and cares about you, if the worst thing that can happen to you is that you end up in the basement, and God damn it, you owe it to yourself and the world to try to climb out Everest, to try to start that business, to try to do all of those things that you want to do. That's all. <laughs> Ernest, thank you for leaving us with powerful, beautiful words. And thank you for this fantastic conversation. Don't forget again to follow Ernest White the second. <laughs> yes. ErnestWhite2.com, flybrother.net. And following him on Instagram as well at Fly Brother. So thank you again. All right, ladies. Thank okay. you, Ernest. Okay. Bye. 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 Thank you. Bye. All right. So Marley, let's start with your uh, weekly recommendations. Yes, I have two because in my most recent transitioning of work, you know, making now and then also independently making, it's very interesting. So a new YouTube website that I found and also website in general called The Financial Diet on Instagram and as well as on YouTube, they gave great financial tips. So great ideas, especially for women. It's very women driven and apps and suggestions and ideas and how to like watch your spending on clothing and for shopping and shopping tips and things like that. Fantastic kind of just like you want to hear something running in the background or you made an error maybe in your budgets and things like that, they give great tips. Um, So I think that's a fantastic one if you're looking to kind of fix your budgeting and things like that. Another one, a great website that I love that recently for credit cards and things. So you do your good research on credit cards if you're going to open another one. It's called nerdwallet.com. One of my favorite websites every time I'm debating about opening another credit card, (laughs) which I try not to, but you know, when you have to move things around and you have to kind of redigest everything that you do have, it's a great opportunity to kind of see where you're at with things. So those are my recommendations for the week. 
Very cool. Very cool. I like it. And I actually think I might um, check out what you just said. Honestly, I think that it's exactly right up the alley of where my temperature is in life right now. So that was really awesome. I, I would say my two recommendations are, um, one, uh, yoga. I really love yoga. I think that yoga has allowed me to meditate, to kind of um, relieve stress. It kind of allows me to slow down a little bit and it allows me to stretch certain areas that are very difficult to stretch. Um, I want to get into it on a more consistent basis. Um, I I used to dibble and dabble in the past, but never committed 100%. But now that I like the peace that it provides, I really think that it's awesome. Um, It's not easy. You sweat like crazy. Mm -hmm. And even if guys, there's like guys in the class with me too, and they're having a really hard time. Like it's very rigorous and people think that it's like simple, but it's not. It's extremely challenging. A lot of core workout. It allows me to kind of, I don't know how to say it. It allows me to kind of escape for, in a sense, and then come back in a very focused state of mind. They promote positivity. They promote um, sharing, love. And it, it you'll be surprised if you hear that in the morning, it really does change your attitude for the Set day. Up your so whole that's day my, the, your whole day for it. So my, my recommendation is very simple this week, just yoga, do yoga. And I think that even if you incorporate it once in a while or once a week, once a month, I think it's worth it. Have you done hot yoga? I haven't done hot yoga, but I am going to be doing hot yoga soon because I actually made a connection with a very cool young lady that's very into yoga and she lives by hot yoga. So I'm going to go to class with her one day. I'm a little nervous because I'm like sweating in regular yoga. <laughs> <laughs> so, can you imagine? Yeah. Uh, I'm, I'm praying for you. I've done that once before and it is, it's, it's an interesting take on it. It's an interesting right. take. So I hope you enjoy that. But I love that yoga. That's a newfound kind of like direction, right? Like that's a newfound kind of like it kind of aligns like, with, it kind of aligns when, once you start getting into a space of um, truly rehabilitating yourself or truly overcoming objections or truly getting to a space of knowing one, yoga kind of comes up somehow. So mm-hmm. there's no coincidence behind it. You know what I mean? It, it kind of works online because you're connecting with the earth, the body, the soul. It just, it all works together. Yeah, so I love I, that. I don't want to bore nobody, but it, it's really cool. It's awesome. No, that's beautiful. There's no boring here. That's absolutely beautiful. And these are fantastic recommendations we usually give to better others, right? There's always someone out there in need. Maybe there was someone who hasn't even thought about opening to yoga yet, right? Like that's just not a location or a space that they've opened themselves to. So fantastic recommendations. And both of these recommendations are for everyone's health, wealth, benefits, um, in the long run. And as we all grow as adults and like learn new things in life, these are fantastic to share with others. You never know who needs it. And it makes you flexible, which is always a good thing. We need it for, flexibility is needed for a lot of things out here in these streets. Sure is. <laughs> Make it keeps a lot you of young. It keeps you young. You, you can't like be in pain when you pick up your kids' toys. You feel me? Like you need to stretch, you need to move your body. We all need flexibility because it's important. It keeps you young. So it's good. Well, those are our recommend. We need a little sample that says recommendations of. Ooh, a little jingle. A little jingle. <laughs> yeah. I think I think the listeners would love. You guys would love that. If anyone wants to make the sound, that'd be great too. Send that over to us. We need a little jingle for that. Um, and those are recommend. PC Richards, awesome. I want to hear about the vision board party you had. Yes, that you. go. I want to know more. I saw all the beautiful pictures and all the wonderful speakers there so tell us all about it how did it go um honestly it it was it was i'm more than satisfied it's it was more than i can ever expect it to be it was excellent it was motivating it was inspiring i am so satisfied there's nothing more fulfilling than when you actually put energy into something and it comes true yeah. um it's such a beautiful experience it's a creative uh it's the creative dream come true you know when you actually say hey i have this idea and then it comes and then you make it happen it's so awesome um i really want to say thank you to the five speakers you all were beyond um informative everyone was so appreciative for the information you guys gave out 
Um, thank you so much for all the vendors. Um, you guys really had an amazing um, product display and you guys also supported you know, me making this happen. Make sure to follow and to like and to go on Facebook on Show Me Productions on Facebook. That's the fan page. You can actually see all of the vendors there. If you guys liked anything that you saw or if you're anywhere in the country and you want to get some of those products, their information is going to be linked to that specific fan page so you guys can check them out. I also want to say thank you to all the guests. Um, I know you guys could have done so many other things on your Saturday, but instead you chose to come to the vision board party. So I'm very grateful for that. And I also want to say um, thank you to everyone who followed up and, and did the testimonials and said that this is helping you carve out the rest of your year. Um, that was the point. And I, I'm really happy that everybody felt, you know, inspired to have a productive 2019. Um, there's going to be more information, more pictures and everything coming and uh, once again, if you guys want to check out the pictures, just go on Show Me Productions on Instagram or Show Me Productions on Facebook, and you'll be able to see a lot of the footage that was taken. Um, it was a lot of work, but it was worth it. And hopefully, you know, with time, as me and Marley have mentioned, you know, she's going to take over the West Coast. I'm going to take over the East Coast. And we're going to keep making these visions come true. Um, put your stuff down. Speak it into existence. Envision your future. Envision what's coming. Believe in your dreams. Only you are stopping you from getting to where you need to be. So thank you so much for everybody who supported. That's beautiful. And congratulations on that wonderful event. Very happy. Um, thank you guys again for listening this week. We hope you enjoyed our recommendations, our conversation. Um, and we don't forget, actually, I'm sorry. Don't forget to follow us. Subscribe on Instagram. Subscribe on YouTube. Facebook. Don't forget to email us. Um, and don't forget to share it with a friend. Share it with one person a day at least. Or once a week. Just share it with one so that we can continue doing this project and continue sharing our love and fantastic recommendations with you guys. Absolutely, guys. Make sure to uh, hit us up if you're interested in being a part of the podcast. Uh, make sure to let us know if you have a great movement coming up and you want to create recognition towards it. Uh, thank you so much for supporting uh, Messy uh, uh oh fresh <laughs> monday's podcast <laughs> we've been doing good but yes fresh monday podcast we appreciate your support and i promise next week we'll talk more about it yeah and uh i am diana c on instagram and marley is at love marley l u v m a r l e y underscore thank you guys again for listening have a great week